And so one of the biggest objections to Sola Scriptura that I often hear is that it simply doesn't work. And I believe you bring up uh, the work of, uh, is it Brad Gregory here? When he yes. talks about yeah. Uh, yeah, how it kind of led to this instant splintering. Um, but one of the books, one of the objections in your book is uh, from Devin Rose, and he kind of gives a syllogism that, and it goes something like, uh, you know, if Sola Scriptura is true, uh, Protestants should be united. Protestants aren't united. Therefore, Sola Scriptura is not true. And so right, right. how would you respond to this claim that Sola Scriptura leads to interpretive chaos or ecclesial splintering? Right. Uh, great question. And it goes back to my opening anecdote, right, about my being accused of being an anarchist. That is what we were talking about, right? Interpretive chaos. I get it. I do get it. And interestingly, Martin Luther got a little taste of that himself when some in his circles uh, began to be, you know, these enthusiasts. They began to go off and and go in worrisome directions like sectarians. So he got a little taste of that himself. They may have misunderstood what he meant. And again, I, I get the people who sigh when they hear Sola Scriptura because they've probably seen these abbreviated Protestants, right? Protestants who think they're being Protestant because they're, they think they're being biblical when they ignore the church tradition. That to me is an abbreviated form of Protestantism. That's the first thing I want to say. I want to say that I take this challenge very seriously. Um, Brad Gregory has made the historical case that the Reformation opened up this chaotic uh, individualism. And really, he kind of says it leads to modern individual autonomy. Uh, Christian Smith, a sociologist at Notre Dame, has written a book about this. Uh, called The Bible Made Impossible, where he's attacking not the Bible, but but Biblicism, which is really a theory that all we need is the Bible. And and he's also saying, as you said, it doesn't work. Um, I, I, I think about this, I guess one way of rephrasing the objection is to talk about the second law of hermodynamics, <laughs> which is the hermeneutical entropy hermeneutical disorder that follows from assuming sola scriptura is right. So I just want to say I do understand the problem, and I do have some things I want to say back. Uh, one of the things I did in 2017, uh, again, to mark the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, was to try to counter this idea that Protestants are divided by coming up with what we called a reforming Catholic a confession. That is an attempt to show that in fact, on the most important points, there's much more unity among Protestants than people see because they look at, you know, the 30,000 different denominations. That looks like a split church. But if you look closer, there's a lot of agreement. So I can say more about that attempt to come up with a reforming Catholic confession if you want, but it was encouraging to see how many people got on board. It was also discouraging to see how many people didn't climb on board, <laughs> to be honest. But that was one thing we tried to do. So I've already talked about the fact that Sola Scriptura doesn't rule out tradition. Um, that's just really important to say. I see authority as a pattern, and tradition is part of that pattern, as is the church. Uh, but scripture is you know, at the top of the pattern. Um, I mean, really what's at the top, I should say, is Christ. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. So the question is, how does Christ distribute his authority? Uh, and I think scripture is one of the means. I think tradition is the other. But look, the authority and light that tradition gives, I believe, is a reflection of what scripture is giving us. So I like to see tradition as the lesser light, the moon to scripture's sun. So tradition really does give off light, as does the moon, but it's always a reflection of the sun, that is, of the scriptures. Um, so I think tradition is our, is our Philip. You know, we need our Philip, the, someone to climb up into the chariot with the 
Ethiopian eunuch and and give him guidance as to how to read. Tradition is our Philip, but scripture is our supreme authority. So I think it's just important to say that Protestants are not bereft of tradition. So, you know, we do have the ability to draw on the church fathers and so on. As I've been saying, tradition is our is a secondary light. Um, I guess the other thing I want to say is that there is this, this pattern, as I've been indicating, the spirit is involved, tradition is involved, ministers of the church are involved as well. Um, so, yeah, tradition is a resource for Protestants. Um, the second thing I want to say is that the differences between Protestants are not always divisions. And here, I think, the idea of dogmatic rank is very helpful. It just reminds us that not every doctoral, doctrinal disagreement is a first-order disagreement. So in other words, Protestants of different denominations often work together, often fellowship, often share the Lord's table. That's important to know. And what enables them to do that, despite their differences, is a common confession, not only of the authority of Scripture, but of orthodox doctrines, these first order dogmas. So I think Protestants are united when it comes to first order doctrines. And we can talk about, you know, how to distinguish first, second, and third order. But um, I think, but let me back up and just be honest here, because there are Protestants who think that every disagreement is a first order disagreement. <laughs> That's why sometimes these disagreements feel like we can never make any progress. But um, again, I want to call that an abbreviated Protestantism. I want to call that a sub-Protestant Protestantism. That is, that's not Protestantism at its best. So I think I need to say, realistically, there are, I'm going to call them small-minded Protestants. Protestants who think that only their group have the right doctrine. But I think many Protestants agree to disagree. We agree about the big doctrines and we agree to disagree about secondary matters, which we recognize are harder to demonstrate as being biblical, you know, definitively. But we respect the fact that, that we're all trying to make sense of the scriptures under the authority of scripture. I hope that makes sense. So dogmatic rank is another tool that I have to answer this question, you know, does sola scriptura produce anarchy, uh, chaos? The other thing I want to say, and again, I'm now speaking maybe idealistically. I'm thinking about ideal Protestantism because, look, um, you know, if we're if we're realistic, as I've already said, not all Protestants are paradigmatic Protestants. But the other note I want to sound here is the importance of dialogical and interpretive virtue. That is, we need to be the kind of people who can dialogue about our disagreements. We need to be the kind of people who can read the Bible virtuously instead of uh, in pride claiming we know it all, we have it right. And part of the, and one of the voices we need to listen to as Protestants are, are Roman Catholics. So for years now, I've been part of evangelicals and Roman Catholics together, uh, a discussion group that meets to discuss issues of mutual concern and to produce statements that reflect just how far we can get in agreeing in these doctrines. So I've been involved in these discussions for years now, but as I say, it takes a certain kind of person to, to dialogue. That is, you have to be open to the possibility that you may not know it all. <laughs> you have to be open to the possibility that you can be corrected by scripture. And so I think Protestants at their best, and I, I think of Luther and Calvin as reflecting this most of the time, <laughs> Protestants at their best display these interpretive virtues. And here's the other thing. I think sola scriptura, rather than being um, 
a reason for being proud about one's own community is rather a check on interpretive pride. Because what it means and what it reminds us is that it's the Bible that's authoritative, not my interpretation of it. At the end of the day, the text can always correct my interpretation. That keeps me humble. And that inclines me to want to listen to other people and how other people read the Bible, including the church fathers and those in the great tradition. So the Protestants I most admire are the ones that work hard to achieve as much unity as possible under the authority of the scriptures. I am embarrassed and disappointed that the reformers weren't able to work out their differences about the theology of the Lord's Supper. But I'm, I'm encouraged that they were able to fellowship and share the Lord's Supper, even if they didn't agree on the details. So I think that's, that's just important to remember. Um, and then the last thing that I would want to say about why Sola Scriptura doesn't have to lead to chaos it has something to do with, with how Protestants do resolve their interpretive differences. I think it goes back to Acts 15, because we have to remember there have always been interpretive differences. Uh, the church in Jerusalem wasn't sure how to treat Gentile believers biblically. You know, did they have to become Jews? Did they have to, you know, follow the laws? And this was a, this was a pressing concern. It might have been the question for the early church, what to do with Gentile believers. And in Acts 15, we see how they resolved it. How did they resolve it? They called a council. And they came to the conclusion that together, you know, they, and they would pray and they would discuss. And then they said, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's, that is the first example of what we can call conciliarism. That is the handling of church differences through assembling church councils that would make theological judgments. And interestingly, in Acts 15, the result of the council that was to be sent to churches all around the world were ta dogmata, the dogmas, the decisions that had been made together. So I think this is what a church council does. And um, one historian, John McNeil, says that conciliarism is the constitutional principle of what he calls unitive Protestantism, uh, which is the kind I subscribe to. I call it mere Protestantism after C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity. But I think it's significant. He sees the idea of forming church councils, representative church councils, as the constitutional principle of unitive Protestantism. And I do see the reformers practicing that even in the 16th century. So. Uh, you said you took a course in Calvin. I don't know if you studied the practice in Geneva where every Friday afternoon, local pastors and regular church people would meet for Bible studies, and they were called congregation, congregations, that is, conferences where people would come together and hash it out, you know, like a seminar, you know, what, what's scripture saying? And um, you know, people would be willing to be corrected by scriptures. So they had to they had to manifest these dialogical virtues, especially humility, the willingness to be corrected from scripture. And Calvin urged ministers in other towns to adopt the practice. He said, This is the best way to achieve consensus in doctrine. So um I know Protestantism looks like it can be a mess, and it has historically been a mess sometimes, but if we remember the interpretive virtues, if we remember this question of dogmatic rank, if we remember that we can appeal to the tradition as a guide, an elder brother, as it, well, as it were, and if we remember the importance of church councils, I think all these means are ways of mitigating 
this uh, tendency towards hermeneutical entropy or interpretive anarchy. Well, hey, everyone, I hope you enjoyed watching that clip. You can find the longer interview using the link in the description. But before you go, I wanted to say a quick thank you to our sponsor today, Kindred. Kindred is a ministry that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God in their daily lives. And they do this by creating these beautiful Bibles complete with full page photos that will cause you to engage with scripture in new and profound ways. You'll read more slowly, more contemplatively, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So if you want to check them out, you can go to kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order today.